One of the key principles of permaculture is the ability to observe your environment and make adjustments uh, iteratively as you continue to learn. And that is something <laughs> that I am doing today. I shared a video about how I created a, a bit of a uh, wildlife water garden slash pond in my backyard. I first created just the water garden with the boggy area and uh, a little bit of water. And then I decided I wanted to extend it. And I bought a secondhand bathtub on Facebook Marketplace for about 30 Aussie dollars. I popped the bathtub about halfway buried in the ground uh, because if I do move, I think I want to take my bathtub with me. Uh, and I siliconed up the plug hole. So I was thinking, and we had a whole heap of rain yesterday. The bathtub was getting filled up and the whole area was getting wet. And it's made me kind of question how I irrigate that space. So being a water garden, I've tried to replicate a bit of a wetland ecosystem and it needs to stay consistently moist. So I pretty much have two tactics to keep it uh, consistently moist. The first is that uh, because there's no like nearby water table um, to tap into for the water, I essentially uh, buried up, sorry, uncovered a whole bunch of dirt, put a PVC pond liner there and then put more dirt and stuff back on top. And all of that soil there essentially stays moist and boggy because of that PVC pond liner. I've essentially just created um, a, like a fake water table to keep one part of it consistently moist. Then the other thing I do is I uh, frequently irrigate it. So I just have a soaker hose that runs through that section and I uh, turn it on every day or every second day just to give it a bit of a spray. And that keeps the parts that don't have the PVC pond liner nice and moist. And that's pretty important for the things like taro that I have growing there. The thing <laughs> that I didn't like about that was that I was relying on putting water into that water garden. So either town water or water from the water tank. And I realized that because I'm not actually using the bathtub pond for like keeping any fish or anything like that, it's just plants in there. I could actually be utilizing that as the water source to keep the garden consistently moist. So I thought, great, how can I essentially set up a little irrigation system that uses the water from the bathtub uh, and then has like a sprinkler or something for the surrounding water garden. Seems pretty simple, took me a while to figure out how to do it. And I've eventually stumbled upon this product. This is not sponsored in any way. I just did my research. I knew I essentially wanted a submersible uh, like pump that I could put into it and one that I could connect a hose or a sprinkler directly to and just have that uh, area around the bathtub, essentially having the water pumped through that sprinkler and going around there. This was definitely the kind of most user-friendly thing I could find. And it's essentially just a submersible garden pump. You can uh, connect a hose directly to it, or it has like a tiny little hose extension piece that you can then connect your hose to. And I'm hoping it works. It's battery operated, so I've got the battery charging and I can hang the little container that houses the battery on the fence near the bathtub. I can have the pump put in the bathtub whenever I want to irrigate it. And then if everything goes right, I can just set, it's got a five, 10 or 15 minute timer, set the timer every day for like five minutes, get it nice and moist. And hopefully I won't need to rely on having that water coming in from the tanks. So I'm essentially creating a little closed loop ecosystem. Uh, assuming that we get enough rain to keep the bathtub uh, nice and full, it should work fine. <laughs> so I'm going to go install this now uh, once it's charged and we'll see if it works and yeah. Alright, this is the moment of truth.
してるのでごめんなさい。なんでつけなきゃいけないの ?So I could have this one. A really cheap and the notorious for getting rips and holes just from the pressure. So, let me cut the end and I'm going to feed it back through this. And hopefully, that means that instead of that excess water just going back in, it will just end up. Looping back into the bottom. I wanted to talk about、uh, a couple of tools that I used to kind of solve a couple of problems that have come up,、uh, and just kind of thinking about how I will、uh, address those problems in my、uh, little irrigation system. And in particular, I wanted to share two systems thinking tools that have been really helpful in the kind of planning、uh, and problem solving phases of this project. So, the first is one that I have definitely talked about、uh, on here before, and I think it's very fitting that、uh, I have a tub, a bathtub in my backyard, and that is my、uh, main kind of water source for the、uh, water garden because this system sinking tool is called the bathtub analogy. <laughs> The bathtub analogy is a visual model for conceptualizing stocks and flows in a system. Stock and flow in systems thinking refers to the presence and the dynamic movement or flow of energy through a system. Now, energy can be anything from resources to information to capital. Now, inflow is just the amount and the speed of energy that is entering the system. So, in our bathtub analogy, it is the water coming through the tap. Stock is the amount of energy stored in the system, and in the bathtub analogy, that's the actual water in the tub. Outflow is the amount and speed of energy that is exiting the system, and in the bathtub analogy, that is the water being drained through the hole. Now, a system will have a bit of a buffer space between the maximum and minimum levels of stock. The maximum is the amount at which the system will become unstable if it surpasses. If there is too much water in a bathtub, it's going to overflow. Now, the minimum is basically what the system needs in order to function and achieve its goals. So, if the bathtub is empty, we are not able to have a bath. There is a minimum amount of water that we actually need in that system to have a bath. So, by turning the tap on and off, and by adding and removing the plug, we can alter the flow of energy. And it's our job to be strategic about how we actually alter the flow of energy in the system so that we can have relative stability remain within this buffer and still be able to achieve our goals. So, that bathtub analogy is really useful for just kind of visualizing and conceptualizing how to balance the flow of inputs and outputs. And making sure that the stock, so the water in the tub, remains fairly consistent so that the system itself、uh, can remain relatively stable. Another thing that has kind of helped me address the potential problems that I think I might have when it comes to keeping those stock levels、uh, nice and good is、uh, a tool called、uh, causal loop diagrams. These are a really common system syncing tool.、Uh, they're probably the main type of systems mapping when it comes to understanding causation in a system. And they sound really complicated, but once you get your head around them, they're not that hard. I will link down below to another video that I've created about causal loop diagrams, but I will go into them briefly here. I think that they are a very useful tool, particularly in permaculture, because one of the principles of permaculture. 
is to apply self-regulation and accept feedback. Feedback in systems thinking actually refers to the way in which the outcomes of a process or the outcomes of something that um, a system is performing actually feeds back into that system, adapt and adjust. Um, and that's really important because we often think of a system as just this thing, but systems are dynamic. They are constantly changing. They involve not just components and relationships, but the ways in which these actually change. Uh, so they are dynamic, they are constantly changing. And this is a whole branch of systems theory called systems dynamics. I have a free systems thinking course that I'll link down below where I kind of dive into systems dynamics uh, and how systems function uh, a little bit more. Understanding feedback in the context of systems thinking through something like a causal loop diagram is a good way to kind of understand uh, the feedback in a system and to kind of intervene and apply your own strategies to self-regulate that system. So we use causal loop diagrams to help understand the causal relationship between two or more variables. So in this example, we're going to look at variable A and then a second variable, variable B. Now, if there is a causal relationship between variable A and B, we will draw an arrow from variable A to variable B. We'll then need to make a note at the end of that arrow of the type of causal relationship. So it's either going to be a positive relationship or it's going to be a negative relationship. Now, if there is a causal relationship between variable B and variable A, then we'll also need to draw an arrow that goes from variable B to variable A, and we'll need to make a note of whether that is a positive or a negative relationship. Now, what we have here between variable A and variable B is a causal loop. There is a closed loop between A and B, which means the two have an effect on each other, regardless of the effect that other variables have. Now, there will, of course, be other variables within the causal loop diagram as a whole, but these two together are a closed loop. In this example, we could also see that the relationship between variable A and variable E is another closed loop. And we could even go as far as to say that the relationship between variable A, variable B, variable C, and back to variable A, that is another closed loop that we can see there. Now, what makes a relationship a positive or a negative relationship? In this example, from variable A to variable B, this is a positive relationship. So let's illustrate it with the example of somebody feeling tired and their intake of coffee. So tiredness is the first variable and variable B is coffee intake. Now, the reason that is a positive relationship is because if the variable of tiredness increases, so does the person's coffee intake. So a change in variable A leads to a change in variable B in the same direction. If that was a, uh, if we take that example and we look at the person's tiredness decreasing and the person's coffee intake would also decrease. So it doesn't matter that the direction is going up or down. That's not what the positive or negative is about. It's about whether the direction of the variables matches. So when tiredness goes down, coffee intake goes down, that's a change in the same direction. So that is a positive correlation. If we were to look at the relationship between coffee intake and tiredness, that is a negative relationship because if the person's coffee intake increases, the chances are their tiredness is going to decrease. So those changes actually go in the opposite direction. In the same way, if we were to look at the person's coffee intake and the coffee intake was decreasing, their tiredness would probably also increase. So that change, as you can see, doesn't matter which direction we're looking at it, it's going in the opposite direction. So because that's going in the opposite direction, that is a negative relationship. So when we're looking at our two variables, a positive relationship is when the change is going in the same direction between the two variables. They're both going up, they're both going down. The negative relationship is when the change is the opposite. So one variable goes up, the other goes down.
Now, when we look at the feedback in the causal loops in our causal loop diagram, if a loop has more positive feedback, it's going to be a reinforcing loop, which is one that amplifies or reinforces the system's behavior and tends to push the system away from its current state. If there is more negative feedback in the loop, then it will be a balancing loop. And this is one that will regulate a system's behavior and works to keep it relatively stable. Now, the easiest way to figure out if you're dealing with a uh, balancing or reinforcing loop is to count the number of minus signs, the number of negative feedback relationships in that loop. If there is an even number or zero <laughs> minus signs, then it is a reinforcing loop. If there is an odd number of negative signs, then it's a balancing loop. So we can see here that this one, there is an odd number of minus signs. There is one minus sign that is a balancing loop. And when we put all of our causal loops together, we can create some sort of map or a visualization where we can really see how changes in one variable affect changes in the other variables and how all of this begins to feed back into the system. And we essentially can see the stability of the system and what the future behavior of the system might look like. So I really hope you guys found this video useful. I think that there are two main uh, principles of permaculture that can benefit from these tools. The first being uh, capturing and storing energy. I think we can use the bathtub analogy to really think about um, the stocks and flows of energy in our system. And then of course, when it comes to applying self-regulation and accepting feedback, we can use causal loop diagrams to understand and intervene in our systems to deal with feedback so that we have more stable systems.